the message today by talking about two very important questions. Now, if you're here or you're watching online, and you're already a born-again Christian, I know that you already know the answers to these questions. But the good news is, here at Calvary, we have 30-plus average visitors every weekend. That's just the people who go and get the books. That's, um, sometimes we have visitors that come that, that don't get the books. They're just checking us out. But we have 30-plus visitors every single weekend, and I, there's no way I can know the condition of everybody's heart. So it's incumbent upon me to ask and answer these two questions often. So here's the questions. We'll put them up on the screen. Question number one is, how can I receive eternal life? And then question number two is, what should I do after I receive eternal life? Now, you need to know that most people in the world this morning, they're not thinking about those two questions. Most people in the world this morning are thinking about all these other questions, which, if we're honest, in the light of eternity, really are not that important. But ladies and gentlemen, those two questions right there, they're the most important questions that anybody could ever be asked. And so regarding the first question, how can I receive eternal life? Sadly, if you ask most people that question, they will get it wrong. Sadly, if you ask most people in our world that question, they're going to give you a wrong answer. And usually the answer that they're going to give revolves around some kind of human effort or good works. I don't know if you knew this, but biblical Christianity is distinct and separate from all other world religions, pseudo-Christian cults, false philosophies, right? Biblical Christianity is distinct in a few things, but I'm just going to talk about one this morning, and that is that all religions teach that there has to be some kind of effort, some kind of merit, some kind of way that mankind can earn his salvation. That's human religion. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why we are so grateful for the God-revealed way of biblical Christianity. And so what does God's word say in answer to that question? Well, here it is. It's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by, can you shout out that word, please? Grace. For by grace you have been saved through, go ahead and shout out this word, faith. And, and look at this. People talk about earning their wings. People talk about meriting heaven. He says, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one will boast. And so when asked, how in the world can I receive eternal life, even though our culture is never going to quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9, if we're asked that question here at Calvary, our staff, we're going to quote that verse every single time. Here's why. Because it comes from the Bible, and we believe that the Bible is God's word, and it's the final authority for everything that we believe. And so every other religion, every other pseudo-Christian cult teaches that man has to reach up somehow to God, but only biblical Christianity teaches grace and that God initiated it all, and he reaches down to man. And so thank the Lord, right, for his grace. Now, from this passage in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we arrive at this truth right here. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, if anybody denies that biblical statement and they attempt to merit their way by works into heaven, if anybody, a phrase I often hear, as I said earlier, tries to earn their wings, right, through self-effort or good works to try uh, to get to heaven, they may be religious, but they're lost. They may re wear religious garb, and talk religious talk, but they're lost. And the reason that they're lost, here, here's why, is because they're depending on themselves to save themselves, and ladies and gentlemen, that's pride. Pride is the sin, the first sin that, was, um, that came into the heart of Lucifer as the anointed cherub before he got kicked out of heaven. And so what does the Bible say? It's not self-effort. It says, this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should, what's that last word? 
boast. So God doesn't want us to be prideful. It's a gift from God. All right? So how, do we, how are we saved? There's two words I want to talk to you about. Turn and trust. Can you guys all shout out the word turn, please? Turn. And then please shout out the word trust. trust. So turn and trust. In other words, we have to be willing to turn from our sin. We have to be willing to turn from our self-effort, our so-called merit. We have to be done with all of that. And we have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his all-sufficient payment for our sins on the cross. And it's when we trust in Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he paid it all on Calvary, that he died for every single sin we've ever committed, past, present, future. When he was done, he said, it is finished. So when we turn and we trust in Christ alone, guess what? We're born again. We get saved. We receive new life in Christ. Now, after a person receives eternal life, is that it? Is the new birth being born again, is that the end of the story? Well, let me ask you this question. When a baby is born, is that the end of their life? No, it's just the beginning, right? It's not the tape, it's the starting gun. Now we have our whole spiritual lives to live for the Lord, and that leads us to our second question. Question one, how can I receive eternal life? But here's question two, what should I do after I've received eternal life? Now just as we answered question number one from the word of God, we're gonna answer question number two the same way. And so I want you to raise your hand if this is true of you. If it's not true of you, please be honest with yourself and with, and with God and don't raise your hand. But if you are 100% sure that you have turned from your sin and self-effort and that you have chosen to trust in Christ alone and his full payment for your sins on the cross and you know you're saved, I want you to raise your hand right now. I'm going to raise my hand with you. All right, great. Everybody who's raised your hand, check it out. I want you to uh, look at the next screen. Colossians 2.6. Here it is, here's the answer to the second question. Just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to, what's the next two words? Follow him. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what this church is all about. First, we preach the gospel here at Calvary. We preach the gospel that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We preach the gospel that people need to turn from their sin and self-effort and embrace Christ, accept Christ by faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because we want people to come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus. It's not about you reaching up. It's about God reaching down. It's not about what you've done. It's about what Christ did on Calvary. And when you finally get that, you see, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you finally get that, you're born again. And so thank the Lord for that, right? But then after someone gets saved, we encourage them, it's time to follow Jesus with all your heart. The gun has gone off, boom, and now you're in a race, and you need to go for that tape with all your heart. And so this is why our mission statement says on our, on our website that we exist to help people of all ages become lifelong followers of Christ. What is Calvary Port St. Lucie all about? We're all about helping people of all ages become lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. You say, where do you get that mission from? We get that mission from Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And so Jesus said, go and make disciples. Can you guys please say make disciples? Make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is a learner, a pupil, and a follower of his or her rabbi. Jesus is our rabbi, and he's a lot more than a rabbi. He's the Lord God in flesh. And so go and make disciples, Jesus said, of all nations. A disciple is a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ. So that is our mission. What is our model? Our model here at Calvary is that we follow the early church. You see, what happened on the day of Pentecost after Peter preached the gospel is that 3,000 people 
turned from their sin and self-effort and trusted in Christ as Messiah, King, and Lord of their lives. And they were born again. And by the way, after they got saved, what's the first thing that they did? They were baptized. They didn't get baptized as infants. You never see infant baptism anywhere in the New Testament. First they met Jesus Christ. First they got saved. And then they were baptized. If you go with us to Israel, we'll take you to the archaeological remains of the mikvahs around the Temple Mount where they walked down into the water, immersed themselves, and then walked back out. They got saved, and then they got baptized. And then what did they do after that? Acts 2.42, middle, bottom of your screen. They devoted. They weren't lackadaisical. They weren't apathetic. They didn't go to church twice a week and check a religious box. They devoted themselves to four things, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, that's communion, and prayers. That's what we model this church after. And then, of course, our message in the second half of all of our gatherings is a life application, verse-by-verse teaching of God's word. And we do that because Jesus ended his great commission by saying, teaching them not some things that I've commanded you, but teaching them all Ladies and gentlemen, teaching them all that I've commanded you, for lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. This is why we exist. I hope that does something in your hearts, and I hope that you will help us make disciples, lifelong followers of Jesus Christ. Now, as we're finishing up Matthew chapter 8 today, you you need to know that being a disciple of Christ, following Christ, will involve three things. And so here's where we're going this morning for the rest of our time together. Jesus says, follow me. And from the word of God, for all of you who raised your hand, what are you in for? What does it involve following Jesus? It it involves a daily commitment. It involves daily confidence. And get ready, everybody, because it involves daily conflict as well. Okay, and so right now, if you're looking at Matthew chapter 8, verse 18, can you just say amen so I know you're there? All right, so Matthew chapter 8, verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders, you got to get this, to go over to the other side. The other side of what? The other side of the Sea of Galilee. So on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, he gives an order, let's get in the boat and let's go to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. We'll come back to that later. Don't forget that. Verse 19. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Verse 21. Another of of the disciples, and in the context you need to know that Matthew uses that term very loosely. But another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And so here we see that two men approached the Lord Jesus. The first guy that approaches the Lord Jesus, he's a scribe. What does that mean? Well, in that day, in that age, the scribes were the ones who hand copied the scriptures from manuscript to manuscript, and they also interpreted the scriptures for their Jewish community. And so he comes up to the Lord. And then later on, you got this disciple, a term, as I said, that Matthew uses loosely to describe somebody who's been listening to Jesus. He's got an interest in Jesus, so he's kind of following him around, right? Nothing more than that in this context. So let's start with the scribe. The scribe has been watching the powerful works of Jesus Christ. He's been hearing the powerful words of Jesus Christ. I think he's starting to get emotional. And in an emotional outburst, he says in verse 19, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. All right, so how does the Lord respond to this guy? Did he say, great, I am so glad you've made the choice to follow me wherever I go. Prepare yourself, man, get ready because you're about to receive an abundance of health and wealth and prosperity. Let's go. Is that what the Lord said to this guy? No way. Actually, he said something 
way more challenging. He said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, something tells me that is not the response the scribe expected. It is not what he thought Jesus was going to say. Jesus basically told this guy, are you sure you want to follow me? Right? Because I don't even have a home that I own where at the end of the day, I can lay down and rest my head. In other words, are you sure you're going to want to uh, follow me? Even though foxes have homes and birds of the air have homes, I don't have a home. All right, in other words, hint, hint, young man, there's going to be nights when you're going to have to sleep on the cold, hard ground. Are you still in it? All right, so what does following Jesus involve? Well, once again, point number one, if this is what God was, uh, the Lord Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, was calling this young man to. He was calling him to a daily commitment. Now, don't make the Bible say something it doesn't say. Jesus was not saying to this guy, if you follow me, you can never own a house. It's not what he's saying. There's nothing wrong with owning a house. What he was saying is, sometimes following me, young man, is going to be tough. Now, as you know, as we're going verse by verse through God's word, every once in a while we gotta stop and we gotta apply it to our lives, right? You didn't come to church just to get a bunch of information. You came to church also to find out how should I live this Christian faith out. In other words, we don't want to just puff up our minds and have a lot of head knowledge because the more we puff up our minds, now all of a sudden everything gets off balance and we may fall over, right? We got to make sure that we're always balancing, receiving the word in our minds, letting it go to our hearts, and then eventually down to our feet. So here's my question. Don't answer out loud. I want you to answer it in your heart as we apply this part of the Bible to our lives. When life gets hard, will you remain committed to the Lord Jesus Christ? That's my question. For everybody that's in this room and everybody who's watching right now, when life gets tough, will you remain committed to the Lord Jesus Christ? If prosperity never comes, will you remain committed? Now we all know Matthew 6, that if we seek first the kingdom of God, all these things, the necessities of life, will be added unto us. In other words, God has promised when we put him first, he will meet our needs, not necessarily, or not at all, our greeds. Needs, yes, greeds, no. So my question to everybody, which you'll probably never hear on so-called Christian television, is if prosperity, material prosperity, never comes to you, will you still remain committed to the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the question. If your family becomes angry with you, if your friends avoid you, if the doctor someday looks across his desk, takes off his glasses and says, I'm sorry to say, it's a malignant tumor, it's cancer. If someone you love with all your heart dies, and now that heart is broken into a million pieces. When the storms of life come, will you remain committed to Jesus Christ? This is the cost of discipleship. This is what Jesus is trying to get across to us through his word today. If God calls you to sell everything here in the States and go to a third world nation and for the rest of your life be either a missionary or a church planner, Will you in that day say, yes, Lord, and do exactly what he's calling you to do? Or if he calls you to stay in the States and things get difficult here, will you remain committed? You see, we've had it so easy here in the United States of America. Not so in the 1040 window. Somebody asked me, what's the 1040 window? Um, you got to Google it or go to God Questions, right? But it's the most persecuted area in the world, 1040, right? Across um, northern Africa and into uh, the Middle East and so on and so forth. Uh, the most persecuted area where Christians today are losing their lives and being persecuted. So we got it made in the shade over here in America. We got it made in the shade 
um, here, but not all of our brothers and sisters around the world, they are being persecuted, ladies and gentlemen, in a great, great way. Now here's what I believe. If you're, if you're listening right now, say amen, please. I believe that if something doesn't change soon in the United States of America, persecution is coming for all of us. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that if our nation, I'm talking about an ideological thing right now, if our nation continues to drift into what I call extreme leftist lunacy, if that continues to happen in our nation, ladies and gentlemen, here's what you're gonna find out. You're gonna find out that Christians in America are not only gonna be mocked on the world stage as we saw in the opening ceremony of the Olympics. And by the way, that wasn't just Christians in America who were being mocked, that was Christians all around the world who were being mocked. We are not just gonna be mocked on the world stage like we saw in the Olympics opening ceremony. We're going to be persecuted. If something doesn't change soon, persecution is coming. And some may be beaten, some may be imprisoned, some may even be martyred. It's already happening, as I said, in the 1040 window, so don't think it can never happen here in the West. No, it will happen unless something changes. And you know what's going to require, what's required for there to be a change? It's for the church to wake up and start speaking out and living out their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it's gonna take. That's what it's gonna take. But as long as we're afraid, as long as we're cowering, as long as we think that Christianity is some kind of disease that, that, that's contagious and we gotta hold it for ourselves, give me a break. No, if you're really saved, if you're really born again, if you really love the Lord, then what you're gonna do, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. What does that mean? That means living loud and proud for the Lord Jesus Christ in public. That means speaking the truth in love. That means making sure in November that you have a Bible in one hand and a, a, a voter's guide in the other hand and you vote your biblical values. That's what it means. But the church has to wake up. The church has to wake up and realize our responsibility. My prayer is that we all remain committed to Christ, speaking out and living out our faith no matter what comes. And so the scribe, right, approached the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we got another guy who's coming up to Jesus, and that's a disciple. As I said, Matthew uses this term very loosely. This guy is not a committed follower of Christ. He's just interested in the Lord. And he comes up and he says to Jesus at the end of verse 21, Lord, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. In other words, the Lord is calling this guy to follow him, but wait, let me first go and bury my father. Now, it's very, very important that you don't misunderstand what this guy was asking the Lord. It wasn't like, because otherwise you're gonna think Jesus is really cold-hearted. It wasn't like this guy's dad had died and he just wants to have the funeral and bury his dad, you know, that, that week. But Jesus is like, no way, hey, I'm leaving today. You're with me or without me. Are you with me or not? That's not what's going on here at all. This guy's dad is still alive. What he's asking Jesus is, can I stay back and take care of my father until he dies? By the way, that's an indefinite period. And then I will follow you. Plus, if the son waited to follow the Lord, he could in collect his inheritance after the dad is gone. And I don't know, but maybe he's thinking, then I'll be financially set to follow Jesus. Then I'll be financially set to go into the ministry. How does Jesus respond to this young man? It says in verse 22, he said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. In other words, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Apparently, this guy's family and the community there had rejected Jesus. And how many of you guys know that when you reject Jesus, that he's the only source of spiritual life? So if you reject Jesus, you remain in your sins. If you reject Jesus, you remain spiritually dead. Let the spiritually dead 
bury their own dead, you come and follow me. Yes, even before you receive your inheritance. And I wonder if this young man is thinking, you know, that doesn't make any sense. And that leads you to your next point, if you're taking notes today, and that is that, ladies and gentlemen, faith involves following Christ even when it doesn't make sense. Now, I know that all of us are called to ministry. All of us have our lanes to run in. Uh, Most of you uh, are involved in secular jobs, and I praise God for you because you guys can be salt and light where I could never be salt and light. You guys have inroads and relationships where I could never have inroads and relationships. And so thank the Lord, right, that he's called all of us into ministry. Well, what I'm talking about right now in this part of the message is a divine call to a person to go into full-time ministry. You see, when that divine call for full-time ministry comes, some people, like this guy, have the attitude, well, when I'm financially set, then I'll go. After the economy picks back up, then I'll go. After I get my kids through college, then I'll go. After I enjoy this high-paying job, maybe for another five or 10 years, then I'll go. After I get my retirement account up to where it should be, right, and I feel safe, and every I's dotted and every T's crossed, then I'll go. But if they were honest, what they're really saying is, I'll go into full-time ministry when it makes sense. And I would have to ask that person, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Because faith involves following Christ even when it doesn't make sense. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting ready to start year five of our Christian school across the street. Do you know when we started CCA? We started Calvary Christian, College, uh, Calvary Christian Academy in 2020. Does anybody remember that year? Oh yeah, we all remember that year. That's the year we all got a gut punch. Everybody got a gut punch. And here's what happened. We knew that God had called us to build a Christian school. We built the building. COVID hit. We had budgeted our first year for 200 kids. Only 99 kids were signed up. What does that mean? That means if we go forward, man, potentially we're way in the red. And I remember that executive team meeting and there were tears. And I remember how we talked about one of the possibilities is just make good on our commitment to these teachers who've already left their jobs and we've already hired them to serve and teach at Calvary Christian Academy. And so we're going to just pay them, but we're going to wait to start the school until the next calendar year of August of 2021. And I remember in that meeting... And again, it was a hard, hard meeting. I remember that we made the final decision that, you know what, wait a minute. Where God guides, God always provides. And so we're moving forward. The budget's for 200, we got 99 kids, but God is bigger than all of that. We're going forward. And we opened our doors to Calvary Christian Academy in August of 2020. And guess what happened? God provided. God took care of us. We ended the year in the black. Everything was fine. Ladies and gentlemen, what I love about Calvary is that we don't have a corporate mindset. We have a faith-filled mindset. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Hey, yeah, we have board meetings. We just had one last Tuesday. It was very successful, praise the Lord. We have executive team meetings. We have budgets. We have P&Ls. We have audits. Right? We have all of that. We cross our T's and we dot our I's. Right? But, but here's what you need to know. That if God calls this local church to do something and it doesn't make sense financially, we're moving forward and we're going to do it because God is always going to provide where he guides. That's how we live. Now listen, it's fine for me to talk about the church, but you got to apply this to your life. you got to stop playing it safe. You got to stop waiting, right, until everything is perfect before you do whatever God's calling you to do. Some of you are young people and you're married and you're waiting to have kids until it makes sense financially. Let me tell you something. It's not going to make sense financially. Have some kids. (laughs) 
My wife and I had Megan and Mandy and Mary and we were pretty much broke. But God came through and God provided for us. And guess what? They're healthy and they're adults and they're living for the Lord. God took care of it all. I want to encourage you to marry, if God's calling you to two, marry young and have lots of kids and just let God provide. We got to get back, listen, to the nuclear traditional family here in America. We got to get back to that. We got to stop playing it safe and just step out. Did you know that Christian birth rate is plummeting while other world religions birth rate is skyrocketing? My goodness, what are we doing? I tell you what we're doing, for a lot of people, we're living for ourselves and not for the Lord. And so if we wait until it makes sense to obey the Lord and step out in faith, it won't require any faith. And ladies and gentlemen, without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. You gotta have faith. Speaking of which, that leads right into our next story, verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. And I love this about Jesus. But he was asleep. You think Jesus is worried about anything? Verse 25, and they went and woke him up. They're panicking. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, you keep playing it safe. When God's called you to do something and you're holding off and you keep playing it safe until it all makes sense, you're gonna get a rebuke from the Lord. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. Verse 27, and the men marveled saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now the Sea of Galilee is actually a really large lake. It's approximately eight, um, 13 miles from top to bottom, so 13 miles long and approximately eight or so miles wide. So imagine Midway Road down to Becker and 95 over to US 1, and that's about the size of the Sea of Galilee. Now if you go with us to Israel, we'll take a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. Once it calms down and we get the green light, we're going back, we'll keep going back every other year, maybe someday every year, but we're gonna go back. We'll take you on a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee, and uh, we'll see all the mountains in the area, including my favorite, Mount Hermon, which is about 60 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, 9,000 plus feet tall. Currently, it's on the borders of Israel, Golan Heights, um, Libya, I'm sorry, um, um, Syria, and Lebanon. That's the Mount Hermon, and that's where we believe Jesus was transfigured. And so down on the Sea of Galilee, sudden storms are not uncommon, and that's what happens in our story. Now, before the storm hits, the weather's really nice. Jesus gets into the boat, right, and he's feeling tired. He's been ministering and teaching and preaching, and so he goes back into the stern of the boat, and he finds a pillow, and he falls fast asleep. But then guess what happens? Bam, the storm hits out of nowhere. And the rain is coming down hard. The wind is howling, right? The waves are crashing over the bow of the boat, and the disciples are being drenched, and they're freaking out. What do they do? They go in a panic and they wake up the Lord. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. Now, you know how sometimes when someone wakes you up and you don't wanna wake up? How are you feeling right then? Remember, Jesus is fully man, fully God. Never committed a sin. Never sinned one time. He had to be a lamb without blemish and without spot in order to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. But I gotta believe that Jesus is a little annoyed right now. And how does he respond? Does he get up, wake up, look at the storm, right? Wind, rain, waves, 
crashing over? And does he go, oh no, we're going to die and hide behind Peter? No. Jesus stood up. He faced the storm. By the way, I'm preaching to somebody. You're going through a storm. You cannot be afraid. You got to stand up and you got to face your storm. He stood up. He faced his storm. And what does Mark's gospel say? He shouts, peace, be still, right? And what happens? Just like that, there's a great calm. Man, I wish I would have been there. We'll watch it in the movie someday in heaven. He says, peace, be still. All of a sudden, the Sea of Galilee becomes a sea of glass. And now what happens? The disciples are freaking out, not because of the power of the storm, but because of the power of the Savior They're like, what sort of man is this? The wind and the seas obey him. All right, so let's apply this part of the Bible to our lives. Right now, I want to share good news with everybody who's here today, everybody who's watching. When it comes to the storms of life, you're either in a storm right now, you're coming out of a storm, or you're about to go into a storm. And you think, how can that be good news? Here's why. If you're with me, say amen. Because your Savior is greater than your storm. That's why it's good news. That's why we don't have to be afraid. Because Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody who raised your hand at the beginning of the service, you're born again. That means your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says you are seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. He promised, I'm not going to leave you. So if you're going into a storm, don't be afraid. Why? Because the Savior is greater than the storm. And you say, well, why doesn't he just make it go away from me? Because he's going to leave you in there until he accomplishes his purpose in the storm, which is sanctification, which is being set apart, which is being conformed to the image of Christ. And sometimes that takes a lot of storms in our lives. All right, and so if the disciples would have only believed that the Savior was greater than the storm, they would have had confidence, and that's what the Lord wants us to have. And so when following Jesus, what does it involve? Point number two is daily confidence. So you raised your hand. You said, I'm following Jesus. Okay, it's going to take daily commitment, and it's going to take daily confidence in the Lord. The disciples, they experienced an actual rainstorm, right? Our storms, it might be a debilitating disease. It might be a nasty injury. It might be a doctor looking across from his desk one day at you saying it's cancer. It might be a lost job. It might be a demotion or a betrayal by a friend. It might be a rebellious teen or a broken ma- uh, marriage I go on and on. We all know what storms are. And so here's my encouragement. If you're in a storm right now and the rain is coming down, right, and the wind is howling and the waves of difficulty are crashing over the bow of your life, listen, listen, you've got to remember the promises of the Lord. You've got to remember the word of the Lord. What did Jesus say to these guys before the storm? Can we go back and look at it? Look at verse 18, Matthew 8, 18. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd, he's still on the shore on the eastern side. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, here's your application point. We'll put it up on the screen. If Jesus says you're going over, you can be sure you won't go under. Do you see that? The disciples were ordered by the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's go to the other side. What does that mean? That means that when they were hit with their storm, they had no excuse for being afraid. They had no excuse for freaking out. They had no excuse for all their anxiety. The king had spoken and given them a promise. We're going over. Therefore, they should have been confident that they were not going to go under. When the king speaks to you and gives you a promise, either from the scriptures or by the inner witness of the Holy Spirit in your heart, he will always keep 
his promise no matter how bad the storm gets. If he's made a promise to you, no matter how bad it looks, whether or not it makes sense or not, he's going to keep his promise to you. And so during your next storm, remember God's promise because that is what's going to give you confidence. Otherwise, you're going to freak out and you're going to be rebuked by the Lord. And I would so much rather hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Because I had confidence in a, in a God who never, ever, ever lies to us. Now, if you're fearful this morning, you need to incorporate the word of God into your life. You need to believe his promises. You need to start memorizing God's word and God's promises. And so if you're fearful, Joshua 1.9 is a great, great verse. God looks at Joshua. Moses is dead. Now it's time for Joshua to lead the troops. And he says, be strong and have a good courage. Don't be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If you're facing a big challenge today, Jeremiah 32, 27, God says, behold, I am the Lord. Listen, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? If you're having financial problems, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. If you're doubting your salvation today, Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. See the promises of God? Then listen, if Jesus says we're going over, you're not going under. So let's not be afraid. Let's stop doubting. Let's be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make our request known to God. And the peace, peace be still of God. The peace of God will come. Now, verse 28 says that when he came to the other side, do you see that? When he came to the other side, that means they made it. That means that what he said back in verse 18 happened. That means that if you're in a storm right now, prepare yourself because sunny days are ahead. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, where's that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, imagine that I'm standing in Capernaum at the north end of the Sea of Galilee. And imagine that they just crossed over storm Peace be still, and now everything's fine, and they get over to the east side. Well, east and southeast of the Sea of Galilee is the Decapolis, a Gentile area of 10 cities, and one of those cities is called Gadara. And so they're now going into the region, Matthew says, of the Gadarenes, and when that happens, look at verse 28, two demon-possessed men met him. So here you have... Two guys, and they're full of devils. By the way, um, in the Synoptic Gospels, the devils are called legion. In the Roman army, a legion is 6,000 people. But he doesn't say in the Synoptic Gospels, we're a Roman legion. He says we're a legion. And so how many demons are inside of these two guys? Listen, one's too many. But there's a lot of demons inside of this guy. And these guys. And so, behold, verse 29, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? So their theology is perfect, but Jesus doesn't need advertisement from the devil. So he's going to shut them up here real soon. Have you come here to torment us before the time? In Luke chapter 8, verse 31, they don't want to be sent to the abyss which is the bottomless pit of Revelation 20, verse 3. Have you come to torment us before the time? Verse 30, and now I heard of many pigs. Mark 5 tells us there's 2,000 pigs. A herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, if you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. And so they came out. How many of you guys know when Jesus speaks, demons have to flee? He came out. They came out, and they went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd 
rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Wow. Verse 33, the herdsmen fled. They're freaked out. They're running. Going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. So the synoptic gospels say that these two guys are now dressed. They were nude. They're now dressed, and they're in their right minds, delivered from the devil. Verse 34, and behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. Praise the Lord, right? Well, not so fast. And when they saw him, they begged him to, what's the word? Leave their region. Can you believe these people told Jesus to get out of here? The King of kings and the Lord of lords is standing before them. They're looking at two guys that he just delivered from many demons, clothed and in their right mind. And they said, get out of here. Do you guys understand that everybody has a free will and God does not force himself on anybody? Do you know what Jesus did? He left. He doesn't force. He woos. He draws, he calls, he doesn't force. And so get out of here. Why are they so mad? Well, the herdsmen are mad because he messed with their money. 2,000 pigs are floating in the Sea of Galilee. Deviled ham floating everywhere in the water. And they're really upset because he messed with their money. But ladies and gentlemen, what should have been their response? The response should have been, look at these two guys. He set them free from all evil. Lord, let us follow you. We know you'll take care of us. But that's not it. Leave. Do you see what the problem was back then, the problem is today in our culture? Ladies and gentlemen, it's a rage against God. The reason that you see Christians being mocked on the world stage And the person in the middle supposedly depicting Christ doing this, you know, what does that mean? I'm assuming that means love is love. But do you understand that love, that statement love is love is absolutely false? Do you understand that God is love and God decides what the definition of love is? And do you understand that he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments And do you understand that all forms of sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman is wicked and wrong and sinful? And do you understand that they want to redefine love the way they want to define love? Therefore, they're raging against the true God. You see, that's what's going on in our society. And listen, Silence in the face of evil is evil. We do not shut up and just go to church and stay in our lane. We live for Jesus publicly. We speak out for Jesus publicly. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Lives are on the line. You say, why do I have to speak out? Here's why you have to speak out. Because there's a whole other generation of kids that are coming up. And you know what? The voice of TikTok is very loud. And our voices need to be louder. We have the truth. We have the revealed way of biblical Christianity. And we have to speak. We have to live. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's stop allowing the next generation to go to hell And let's stand up, lives are on the line, and let's speak out. And let's live for the Lord. Because I'll say it again, I'll say it again, and I'm almost done. If you don't want to speak, and you'd rather just keep your mouth shut so that you don't have to face opposition or persecution, I question whether or not you even know the Lord. Because if you love the Lord, you're going to obey his commandments, and you're going to speak out, and you're going to live out proudly for Jesus Christ. So what does following Jesus involve? Last point, not just daily commitment, daily confidence, but daily conflict. And so on that day, Jesus faced spiritual warfare. He got out of the boat, and all of a sudden, two demon-possessed men. And how many of you guys know that no servant's greater than his master? 
And so if Jesus faced daily conflict, if Jesus faced spiritual warfare, you and I are gonna face daily conflict and spiritual warfare. And so I'm gonna wind down the message and close it up by applying this part of the, of the, of the message to how we can engage in spiritual warfare successfully. Look at what Paul says about spiritual conflict. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And then Paul said this, we demolish arguments. Everybody who raised your hand earlier, this is spiritual warfare, this is what you're commanded to do. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Jesus Christ. So we see from this passage that our battle is not on a battlefield, it's not in a ring, our battle is right between our ears. Our battle is in our minds. And what are we called to do? We're called to demolish mental strongholds and arguments that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive and we make it obedient to Jesus Christ. It's estimated that the average person has 50,000 thoughts every day. And before you're overwhelmed by that number, just know that you only have to take captive thoughts that come from the world and the flesh and the devil. Thoughts that contradict the knowledge of the word of God. Those are the thoughts that you and I gotta take captive, but it's not enough, right, just to shoo it away. We gotta make sure it doesn't make a stronghold in our minds. Martin Luther, I put this up every three months, Famously said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from building a nest in your hair. So at just like a bird's gonna fly over your head and there's nothing you can do to stop it, right? So you and I are gonna have random evil thoughts that come in and out. Some of you were raised in a strict religious background and you have a, a nasty thought that comes in your mind, pops in, pops out, and you start getting all guilty and, and, and you start feeling all this shame. Listen. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not in heaven yet. We live in a fallen world, a broken world. You don't have, I don't have our glorified bodies yet. You can't stop birds from flying over your head. You can't stop evil thoughts from popping in and out of your mind. But here's what you can do. You can prevent those evil thoughts from building a nest in your brain. How? By taking that thought captive and making it obedient to Jesus by repenting replacing it. Can you guys please say the word replace? So here it is. Paul wrote to the Philippians and he said, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, what, uh, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And so that's one of the top three verses for spiritual warfare right there. The battlefield is not on a, the battle's not in a battlefield or a ring, it's in our minds. So we take the thought captive and we replace it with thoughts that are true, noble, just, good, lovely, virtuous, and praiseworthy. By the way, where do you find all those things? Right here. We've always had it for 2,000 years. Jesus said this, he said, sanctify them, Father, in the truth, and what is truth? You tell me, your word. So, that nasty, evil thought lands, you shoo it away, but then what do you do? You replace it with the word of God. And ladies and gentlemen, that's how we're sanctified, that's how we're set apart, that's how we're conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, and so, it's not just the Bible. It's also other things outside the Bible. How many of you guys know all truth is God's truth? And so, hey, if you're having problems with your thought life, try this. Try putting on your headphones and jamming a worship song for the Lord. Listen, some of you are so into country. You're so into rock. You're so into rap or whatever. I have no problem with that. As long as the lyrics don't dishonor the Lord, Praise the Lord, right? But none of those songs have any power. Worship songs have power. God inhabits the praises of his people. You're having problems with your thought life? Put on the worship songs because God will inhabit the praise of, your, of his people and where 
God is, demons can't come. You see that? And not just that. Christian books, Christian podcasts, Christian YouTube channels, whatever. Think on these things. 